In this video I'm going to talk about guard clauses in .NET and where you should be using them. I'm going to show you multiple ways how you can implement guard clauses and I'm going to discuss my preferences when it comes to using guard clauses. I'm going to start by explaining with a simple example what guard clauses are in .NET. Here I'm fetching a connection string from my application settings and the getConnectionString method returns a nullable string because the configuration value might not be present in my application settings. However, if the connection string is actually null or empty, then my EF core configuration is going to blow up. I want to prevent this as soon as possible, so I'm going to introduce a guard clause to my code. I'll say if string is null or white space and pass in the connection string that we got from our application settings. And if this evaluates to true, I'm going to throw a new argument exception and I'm going to say the connection string is required and I'm going to specify name of connection string as the argument that is causing the exception. Guard clauses essentially follow the early return principle except instead of returning some value or returning nothing at all guard clauses fail by throwing exceptions and then you have to react to these exceptions and handle them accordingly. Writing guard clauses like this can be cumbersome so I'm going to show you a way how you can implement your custom guard clauses and I'm going to add this implementation in the domain layer shared folder. I'm going to introduce a new class inside which I will call ensure. So let's start by adding a guard clause that is going to make sure that a string value is not null or white space. So I'm going to define a static function, which I will call not null or white space. We're going to pass in a nullable string value as the argument, and I'm also going to accept an optional parameter name. And then inside of this method, I'm going to write my actual guard clause. And the guard clause will be if string is null or white space, and we pass in the value, and if this evaluates to true, we just throw an argument exception. I'm going to pass in a message saying the value can't be null. And let's pass in our parameter name to the argument exception constructor. And now what we can do is replace this check here with something straightforward like this. So we call the ensure class and then the not null or white space method and pass it the connection string. If I want to, I can also pass the parameter name here using name of connection string and we just move the responsibility of this guard clause to our custom guard clause class. So now our guard clause is going to throw an exception if the connection string is null or white space and we got the reusable guard clause that I can use in other places in this project. Now I want to show you a really interesting C sharp feature that allows me to implicitly specify the name of the connection string and here's how that will work. So what I need to do is to decorate the parameter name argument with the caller argument expression attribute. Then I need to specify the name of the argument whose name I want to capture. This will be the value argument, which is this one here. And what this attribute does is when somebody calls the not null or white space method, like we are calling it here, it's going to capture the name of this variable passed in as the argument. So at runtime, the parameter name in the not null or white space method is going to evaluate to connection string, which is the name of my variable here. And this is something that's used in most guard clause libraries out there. And now I'm going to show you a few libraries that come with built-in guard clauses so that you can use them instead of writing your own guard clauses. So I'm going to install a NuGet package in my web project just for this example. And I'm going to look for guard. Now the library that I want to install is Ardalus guard clauses. This is probably one of the most popular guard clause libraries out there and it's maintained and developed by Steve Smith. And I'm also going to show you one more library which is called throw. It's written by Amichai Mantinbad. It's basically a library for throwing exceptions which are how we implement guard clauses. So let me show you how you can apply both of these libraries. So with the Ardalus guard clause library our precondition would have to start with the guard class and then you say against and this exposes a bunch of extension methods that you can use to execute your guard clauses. So let's say we want to guard against null or white space and now we can pass in our connection string and this will achieve the same result as the custom guard clause that we have using the ensure not null or white space method. With the throw library this would be connection string throw 
if null. So you can see a few different approaches. The throw library uses extension methods on the primitive types to allow you to throw exceptions and the custom guard clause library that I implemented is very similar to the one from Ardalis guard clauses which exposes a set of static methods that you can call to execute your guard clauses. It doesn't really matter which approach you choose, they all achieve the same results. I've seen some people roll their own guard clause implementation because it gives them more control and flexibility of the guard clauses that they can write, although you can also extend the Ardalis guard clause library with custom guard clause if you wanted to. So now let's discuss the practical aspects of using guard clauses and where it makes sense to use them. I'll head over to my domain layer. For example, I want to take a look at the invitation entity and you'll see that it has a constructor accepting an instance of a member and an instance of a gathering. So this member is relying on the member and gathering to never be null. And a simple way how you can ensure this is using guard clauses. So let's go ahead and define another guard clause, which will check for null values. So I'm going to say ensure that something is not null. Let's give it a nullable object as the value that we want to validate. And I'm going to use the same approach here with the caller argument expression. Then I'm going to say if the value that is passed into the not null method is null, I'm going to throw an argument null exception and let's just pass in the parameter name. So now I can use my guard clause in my domain to ensure that the member and the gathering are not null. So I can say ensure not null and I can pass it the member and I'm also going to pass it the gathering. So this is one example where I would consider using guard clauses to make sure that my invariants in my domain are protected. And if you think about it, this really is an exceptional situation in the domain because the member and the gathering arguments should never be null in a normal execution flow. What I don't like to do with guard clauses is to use them for validation, although you could achieve this, but you would end up throwing exceptions all the time in your code and there are better ways to solve this using fluent validation or the result pattern where you return a failure result instead of throwing an exception, but let's continue focusing on our guard clauses. I'll head over to the member type and I want to focus on the change name method. This method accepts a first name and a last name. We have a set of guard clauses, making sure that the first name and the last name are not null or white space. So let's expand our custom guard clause to accept an optional exception message. So I'm going to add a message here as another argument, which is going to be optional. And when I'm creating my new exception, I'm going to do a null coalescing assignment. So it's either going to assign the message or the generic message that we had in place before, which says the value can't be null. And now I can head back to my member class and simplify my guard clauses to use my ensure class. And I can say not null or whitespace, specify the first name, and I'm going to specify the custom error message. And I'm going to do the same for the last name here and specify the custom error message for the last name. So now I can get rid of these two guard clauses here and this slightly simplifies the amount of code that I have to write in the change name method. However, there's a better way to achieve this behavior across my application because otherwise I will always have to perform null checks whenever I'm working with the first and the last name. So the solution to this is to represent your first name and last name as value objects that are never allowed to be null and you can achieve this either through the constructor or with a factory method that's implementing some guard clauses. So now I can replace this guard clause here in the first name value object with my custom guard clause and for a maximum length check like I have here I would have to implement another guard clause. So let's see how I could do this. I'm going to copy the code here and let's head over to our ensure class and let's define another guard clause. So I'll say ensure that something is not greater than and I'm going to have two arguments. One is going to be, for example, an integer, which will be my value. Then the other argument is going to be the maximum value, which we want to check that something is not greater against. And I'm also going to capture the parameter name 
using the caller argument expression. So let me add the code that I copied earlier. Let me add the caller argument expression. And now I can implement my guard clause by saying if the value is greater than the maximum value, then throw an exception. And I'm going to use the param name here to pass it to my exception. And I also need to include something for my custom exception message. And let's define another argument here, which will be a nullable string, which will be optional representing our message. So now I can use this guard clause in the first name class and say ensure not greater than and specify the first name length. And then I can specify my maximum length as something I want to check against. And let's pass in our exception message. So we can get rid of all of this. And we have our create method with guard clauses implemented. Let's do the same in the last name method. So I'm just going to update this and replace my exception messages with last name empty and last name too long. Now I can get rid of my guard clauses here and I just need to pass in the last name to my guard clauses so that we actually validate the proper values with our guard clauses. So what did we achieve with this? We wrapped the first name and the last name into value objects that can never be null when they are instantiated. This means that I can go back to my member class and replace the arguments here with first name and last name. This also means that I can get rid of the guard clauses that I had here and rely on the first name and last name not being null. I'm also going to update the properties here to be first name and last name. And then this will cause some compiler warnings that I will need to fix to make sure everything works. So if I build the project, I'm going to get a list of errors that I will have to go and fix one by one. So the create method, is also expecting the first name and last name value object. Now, if I fix this and build again, I'm going to get another list of errors. In this case, the command is using the first name and last name as strings, but what we actually need are value objects. So let's create them by calling first name create, and we pass in the string from our command. And also let's create the last name by saying last name create, and we pass in the last name from the command. And now I can pass in these two values as value objects to the change name method. And I can make sure that they are never null. If I build my project again, I'm going to run into another set of problems. This time it's the create method. So let's go ahead and call first name create. And we pass in the first name. And here I'm going to call last name create and pass in the last name. So if these calls succeed, we're going to get back instances of the value objects, which we can pass to the factory methods. If I build the project again, it's finally going to succeed because I fixed all the warnings. And now I have a design that's already enforcing my constraints through the value objects, which are making sure that the first name and the last name can never be null. So this is how I like to use guard clauses in my domain to enforce my invariants. In general, I will also use the result pattern like I'm doing in the gathering entity, for example. So let me show you the send invitation method. Instead of throwing exceptions, I have a set of guard clauses here, which are checking some values that are required to execute the send invitation method properly. And instead of throwing exceptions, I'm going to return a failure result. If you want to learn more about domain validation using exceptions or the result pattern, you can take a look at this video here where I explain these topics in depth. Thanks for watching this video and until next time, stay awesome.